Welcome back to Live With, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. I'm Dave Palumbo, and today's guest is an oldie but goodie. I haven't talked to him in quite a, some time. I think a lot of people probably wondered what happened to him. The man I'm talking about, Sean the Dinosaur Davis. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sean, I remember you back when I was competing, you know, in, in the 90s and in the you know, early 2000s. I mean, you were one of the biggest guys coming out of, you know, the UK at the time. Uh, you were very popular in the guest posing scene. You were always at all the shows. Uh, you know, you were one of the, the mass monsters we talked about. Uh, you know, and it's interesting because before the show, I asked you what the heaviest you were was. <laughs> it blew my mind. You said, what would you weigh, 330 or something like that? 335 off season. Crazy. Yeah. Crazy. You were just huge. Enormous. What? How did you get into bodybuilding? And what was what was the initial impetus uh, or interest in the bodybuilding world for you? Um, I originally was a, I was going to be a professional soccer player, footballer, mm-hmm. and I I was uh, signed on with a, a professional football team when I was younger, and I, I broke my leg. Uh, uh, cut a long story short, and um, some of my friends were going to the gym and working out, and friends locally were looking good, so. I thought I'd get into bodybuilding, I'd get a bit of weight training. Then yeah. I kind of adapted to it like duck to water. And, and then guy, uh, one guy said to me one day, just, you know, why don't you uh, enter a show? And I did. I entered the show. I had no idea. I was carving up from the local Chinese, you know. <laughs> I put my t- <laughs> Honestly, I put my tan on from the, you know, I, I bought my tan from the local chemist. Uh, yeah. I had no idea. And, uh, yeah, and, 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 and uh, uh, I came forth, but I, I, I loved the, the idea of competing, it was great, and six months later I entered another show and I won it, and then the day after I went to enter another show, uh, I was still a junior in, uh, in com- on competitive scene, and, and uh, I'd, I'd entered the juniors and, and asked if I could go in the misters, and then saw so suddenly the misters said they wouldn't do the misters show if I went into the misters, so, you know, they would have lost a Mr. Class. So I had unofficially won this show without even competing as a junior, but I was still a junior. Uh, and then it just carried on from there. I just enjoyed winning. Then uh, I got a second in just junior Mr. Universe, and I was still a junior when I won Mr. United Kingdom. Uh, and as I say, by, by, by 23, I was Mr. Europe, and by 24, I was uh, Mr. Universe. You know, so Crazy. I saw I'm, that's how my, my, my career developed so fast. Right. And what, you know, year, what year did you win the British Championships to get that pro card? I got my British uh, Championships in 1996. Uh, I had a bit of a layoff when I won with the number in the, in the, pro, uh, in the universe. Uh, and I had a bit of a layoff. As, I, as you say, I did a lot of uh, guest spots and uh, things around, around, around the world. And then I come back into training. A, a friend of mine said to me one day, Sean, why don't you compete again? And... and, and you know, just get back on the scene, and, and I says, oh, I can't be bothered. I mean, anyway, I did. I went in a show. I'd, I'd not even really prepared for it. I did a bit of dieting, um, and uh, I won it. And I thought, oh my god, well, if I, in a few weeks, if I can do that, obviously I was still training, but not competitive. So I got ready for the British British Championships, and uh, in twelve weeks, uh, and died down. And I came. I did. A, I got a fourth, but a year later, I went straight into it, and I won it, and I got my pro card. Right. So and that's yeah, when I, the, the British Championships was tough back then. I mean, that's when the, you know guys like Dorian were winning it and stuff like that, right? I mean, it wasn't an easy show by any means. Well, listen, you had the likes of Ernie Taylor, Dorian won right. it, and uh, you know um, uh, JD Dadu, uh, Amy Francis, right? You know all them and them big British guys. They all won. But the thing was, in them days, you you only got one shot of it, and you only yeah, there was one, one pro card per year given out in, in, in Great Britain. It was crazy when you think about it, you well, know. Well, well, this is this is my argument I have with everybody. You know, yeah. at the moment, you know, it sounds to me, you know, it's like uh, if you open a box of cornflakes or porridge, you, you know, you get a pro card. You know, it's, you know, in them <laughs> days, you got it one pro card, and that was it. Yeah, and and you it, had it. It took you five, six years to win it if you were lucky. You know. Well, some people have been knocking on the door for twelve, yeah. ten, twelve years, and you give up. You give up the dream. <laughs> you know, now even you put a pair of trunks on a bit of tan, they'll offer you a pro card. Right. You know. It wrecks my brain because I know this year in the Brit- in Britain they give twenty pro cards out. I know, I know, I know. It's crazy. Well, it's, it's the whole. You know, when I look at the, the NPC Nationals, which is taking place this weekend in the United States, 
Um, they're giving the top two in every weight class now a pro card. You know, I came in second like three times. I mean, <laughs> I never got a pro card. I would have had a pro card nowadays easily. So it, it, the times have definitely have changed. But back in the 90s, that was the heyday of, you know, the mass monster. You know, Dorian was r ruling the stage. You had guys like Nasser walking around. Ronnie Coleman was coming up in the late 90s. I mean, everyone was huge. Jean-Pierre Fuchs. I mean, everyone wanted to be the biggest guy on the planet. And I'm assuming you did as well. Well, do you know what? I, I, I'm going to say this. I'm so blessed and so fortunate that I got to compete in that era, you know. And it was a crazy era. Everybody was massive, you know, and the thing was, everybody trained hard, everybody diet hard. Yeah. There was no quick fixes or anything like that. Everybody had a certain mentality that they wanted to be. You know, because you was in that era. Yeah, yeah. The training, you know? the training was a huge emphasis on it because I think people really got behind the whole heavy duty training thing. Dorian Yates, heavy weight. You had to do that if you wanted. If you wanted to be big like Dorian, you had to train hard. That was the thing that was impressed most. Yeah, the drugs were in there. And we needed you use the drugs, but but it was really about the training in that era, and I think that really was what pushed those physiques over the top was the fact that they had the food, they had the drugs down, but they also had the training down as well. And guys were competing against each other: who could be bigger, who can lift more weight. And I, I truly believe that's why we saw the mass monsters that we did back in that era. That that is what you're saying, definitely true. You know, I I I, I look at people's routines these days. I look at people say, oh, we train hard, we train. Uh, they haven't got the, they don't know, it, honestly. These people, I can tell in their eyes, they haven't got the will, the desire, the right. wanting to win, you know? Yeah. Some of the training methods I see, I mean, oh my God, I could laugh at it, <laughs> you know? I can tell you so many instances. Of, I used to go and train with um, with Sven Colston, the world's strongest man in Norway. Oh, wow. To, yeah. to, to build my strength up. Mm -hmm. And Ed Cohen. Remember Ed Cohen? Yeah, of course. Eddie was, was still a crazy freak of, oh, of nature. I used to go in Norway and train with them in, in, in Norway do, and try and do the heavy duty train with them. I do the heavy, I'd go and train with Mike Menser in gold. Oh, you did? You, I didn't know you trained with Menser. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, my God. The first time I trained with Menser, he took me in and he said, come on, it's going to be quick. It's going to be quick and easy. Don't worry. Straight in, straight out. I mean, I think the first session was 18 minutes. Um, <laughs> and and. and and he had me spew, only man to have me spewing up after a training session. I was spewing up all over Gold Gym car park and he was laughing at me. <laughs> it was heavy duty, heavy weights, heavy machines, yeah. very short rest period. Keep going, keep going, keep going. You know, I think we did uh, in 18 minutes, we did uh, chest, shoulders, and triceps. Wow. In 18 minutes. And the guy just actually thrashed me, you know. But yeah, I. I I totally agree. We did have the drugs. The drugs were there. But the thing was, we were using clean drugs as well. Yeah. You know? They were all pharmacy drugs. stuff, yeah. You know, I think, uh, did Milos mention something on something about when we was on tour, uh, when we, me and him and Sonny, we went to buy a few bits of stuff uh, in England and, <laughs> and it was the best stuff we could come across. And, you know, it was so funny. Me and me lost were there, just we wanted a few bits and this and that. And Sonny went mad, he thought it was Christmas Day. And he like spent every dollar he had, he'd got on, he'd earned on tour and he, every money he had in his bum bag, he just spent it. <laughs> <laughs> was, 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 back in the day, was it easy to buy steroids in, in England? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that easy. It, it's always, people used to say, you know, it's. Um, it's, you know, living in England, it's a dream. You, you know, you can get what you want. And we could. We could get whatever we wanted. I mean, it was like just you, you, you wanted some on a Monday, you got by the Tuesday. Right. You and know? it was all pharmacy stuff. You guys weren't getting, like, homemade brew stuff back then. We never got any homemade stuff, really, at all. It was all straight out of, right. you know, the pharmacy, the German pharmacies, the British pharmacies, the, right. you know, the factories, you know. So, And it was all clean, you know. And, we know it was really good. And you're stuff, so but... close to the other countries anyway. I mean, you got Spain there who made all, you know, a ton of stuff, France who made a ton of drugs, you know, the Parabones and, and the Winstrols and the Anadrols. I mean, everything was right there for you guys back in the 90s. I mean, it was, it was, it was easy. I remember I actually took a trip to Barcelona to get some stuff too because you <laughs> felt confident buying it in a pharmacy where it was actually made. I mean, that was, it was, that was the way it was back then. Uh, yeah, I mean, if I went to, uh, you know, if I went to Egypt... You know, if just for a short vacation, right. you know, I'd buy myself a thousand sustenon or anthonate <laughs> <laughs> and bring them back. Right. You know, I can remember getting stopped 
with a load of thousands of Suston on me and being marched through customs and, and getting um, stopped with, by the head on show and sat in front of him with three guards around me thinking they've done the biggest bust in Egypt. And yeah. he's, they're laughing at him and saying, the guys, I produced my pro card and I said I'm a professional bodybuilder. And he looked at me and he says, the guy's a professional bodybuilder. It's personal use. Let him go. <laughs> like, <laughs> That's great. That is awesome. put me back in the queue and I'm gone. <laughs> That's awesome. What? Oh, yeah, only in the Middle East they would let you do that. What, talk to me about what were the dosages like that you guys were using in England back in the 90s? How much, like, what would give me a typical off season cycle for you guys? Well, if I, if I, I'm only speaking for myself, I mean, yeah. I know all the guys was it, 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 doing other amounts, but on my best ever off season uh, cycle, which obviously took me up to two, uh, uh, 335, uh, I mean, I measured at 24 inch arms and a 16 inch chest, so. You know, I didn't. But I used to carry a very small waist, so sure. Um, I compete with a 28-inch waist when I was competing. So, um, but I'd have um, two millis pro, um, two millis sustenon, two millis cypionate, uh, two millis propionate viramone, which came in the like of uh, a water base, right. which I used to mix with the sustenon. Uh, and I'd have either two millis parabolin or two millis equipoise depending which one I wanted to mix in the cycle. So there, I'd have 10 Dynabol, one and a half on, but then I always used to use a fast acting, uh, sorry, slow acting uh, insulin. So I'd have up to 150 IUs of slow acting insulin a day. Now why did uh, you, no one was doing that back then. How come you were doing it? Well, I had a brother, I, I still got a brother, <laughs> don't want to pay it him past him. My brother is a diabetic and, uh. um, he used to say to me, Sean, well, what are you, why are you doing the fast acting? Just just try the slow acting, and then you'll be constantly eating all day long. You know, If you're going to eat this fast acting, you're going to actually blow your belly up. You're going to get a great big thick waist you know, through eating, consuming so many calories in such a short space of time. Do it through the day. So I did, and that got me up to eating 15,000 calories a day. Wow. So I was, oh, I was eating it. I was eating three, three times a night. I was How much taking, long acting insulin would you take during the day? Um, pardon? How much long-acting insulin were you taking during the day? How many I used? What, the, the 150? I do 75 years in the morning, 75 years in the evening. Oh, my and God. And that was it. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah, and then I'd just be, oh, no. So, but some people say I used to be crazy. <laughs> what, what, back then, what were you using? Like a detamir? What, what, uh, what was the long-acting one you used? Not, uh, no, is it Nosti? Uh, is it? Uh, it's... I think, well, I think it's an English pharmacy. You mean what make? So, I, you know, I know. What was the, uh, the, the name of it called? Because they had different ones. They had like 70, 20s. What was, like, was it, you know, what was it? What kind of insulin was it? Do you know, do you know, you mean, you mean the insulin? I, I, yeah. You know what? I really, I, you know what? I used to just say to my brother, give me that insulin. <laughs> oh, your brother, oh, your brother just gave it to you. That's funny. <laughs> my brother just said this but You know what the I truth put- is? A lot of people are talking about it now, and I even mentioned that the long-acting insulins are kind of good when you're taking GH, because GH makes you very insulin resistant, and it kind of takes the burden off the pancreas to have to produce that much insulin. So you probably were, were ahead of your time for the wrong reasons, I'm sure, but, but you yeah. actually were preserving your, 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 kid, your, uh, excuse me, your pancreatic beta cell uh, function. Because well, of that. Yeah, because I was also running uh, up to 20 IUs of growth with that as well. Right, so that, with that the, saved your, your, your pancreas probably from burning out, I bet you're using all that insulin. Yeah, um, so yeah, some people used to say that um, some of the things I used to do, I do it, um, and not knowing that I was doing it, I was doing it right. You yeah. understand me? Yeah. Some, yeah. Of the, some of the things were just experimental with me. <laughs> That's not the right way. Right, right, right. <laughs> you know? Talk I'm to me a little bit. Now, at some point, you, your kidneys stopped working. I know in, in, I think it was 2009, you had a kidney transplant. What, what happened? What do you think? What are the, when you look back and try to figure out what went wrong, why do you think your kidneys failed? Um, I, I say, I, I spoke to my surgeon about this and he, he said to me that, um, they tried to put it down to steroids and he did actually turn around and say, I can't say this is down to steroids because I, I'm, I, I'm not. But what I can say is that he said to me and other people, the television and at the time, the television and paid newspapers were trying to get in touch with him. And he turned around and said that. Sean was such a big person that there was a lot of blood going around his body. He would have had a high blood pressure. 
Therefore, right. then this would have been crazy on his on his kidneys. His kidneys would be pumping right. so right. fast that it, it, I just wore the kidneys down. So, therefore, that was his his his. Um, his it was his, your it was your body weight, in other words. He was saying, and whether it was induced by steroid usage or not, it was the fact that he was so big that it was creating high blood pressure situation, which was what we know is the most damaging to the kidneys, and obviously you damaged your kidneys. When you when you were told, hey, you need a, a kidney transplant, what did that? how did you mentally handle that? Because, I mean, bodybuilding was your life at that point. You loved it. Um, was that a tough thing to, to go through? Do you know what? I, it was an unbelievable experience having a kidney transplant. Yeah, um, Going through it, the ups and downs are unbelievable. You know, you get a phone call one day and they say, is that is Sean? Do you want a kidney? You say yeah, yeah. No, come down to the hospital. Get you, you get you there. They put you on dialysis because I was on dialysis for, dialysis for eight, to, uh, 14 months. They, they clean you out. Right. They, obviously, the kidney's on the way because it's like winning the lottery. The kidney could be anywhere in the country. Right. So the kidney's on its way. They're preparing you. You know, you, you, your emotions are all over the place. Um, and and the thing is, I. I I sat on my bed, and next thing, a guy walks in. He walks in the, the, this hospital ward like he was delivering a Chinese, you know, <laughs> and he went, for Davis. So I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, this kidney had just come down halfway down uh, through England, you know, uh, and he walked in, and next thing, when they do the cross match on the bloods and everything, send them through, you have to wait another th uh, three hours, two or three hours. Once that is certain that it's a match for you, then it's all systems go, and they rush you in the... Uh, in, into the theatre, and within an hour and 20 minutes, the kid is put in, right. you know, and you wake up next morning, and it's unbelievable. I mean, I think when I was sat there, the surgeon, when he sat there talking to me about it on the edge of my bed, uh, he was about to put a kid in me, he was a big uh, soccer fan, and he supported the same team as me, and I'd just gone to watch my team in an FA Cup uh, uh, match, and all he wanted to speak to me about was how my soccer team had played that day. Because um, <laughs> he couldn't make it because he'd done a transplant the day before and he, was, and he wanted me to talk him through the match. <laughs> right, 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 right. And you're just wanting to know, yeah. hey, am I going to be alive when this comes out, when I'm done with this thing, you know? Crazy. Uh, it's just, you know, I, I couldn't believe it. I, this guy's going to rip me over and put a kidney in. All he's concerned is about how we played the, the day before, you know? <laughs> Did you recover pretty quickly from that, the, the transplant? I had a few setbacks. I had... Uh, uh, I had two rejections, and oh, wow. because of the size, because of the size of me, the, the the hospital turned around and said, "I do think, because I've taken steroids in the past and used them, they, they that their idea was that maybe he'll take it uh, because they had to give me a course of, chem, uh, of medicines and they had to isolate me for a day in a in a room to shut my immune system down. They're only supposed to do that to you once, but they thought." Because I had a high immune system, they tr will try it again. And they tried it for a second time, and my body accepted it. So, um, so you had two separate kidneys done? Pardon? Two, you had two transplants done? No, they just, they, they, I was, I, 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 I um, my body wouldn't accept it on the first time with the tablets and things, right. and, it, and it rejected it. So they gave me a course of medication and isolated me in a room. And then they thought, it had, it had respond to it then. It didn't respond, so they tried the medication again on the second time of isolating me in a room for 24 hours and sho it shoved my immune system down. Then my body accepted it. Oh, so you, you, didn't, you, you didn't lose the kidney, though. That was great. Was no, ready. I didn't. I had a little bit of um, the rejection caused a little bit of percentage to, to drop, yeah, but now I've got it on a baseline, and it's been on the same baseline for, for 10 years. It's oh, never wow. changed. Cool. That really had, it had to be a scary experience. Was it tough to transition out of bodybuilding and into doing something else? Because I know now you do construction and stuff like that. Was that a t difficult transition to go from being the big guy all the time to being maybe just well, Mr. Average guy, you know? Well, the f first, oh my God, I had to have counseling for, for a start. I had to end up having counseling mm -hmm. um, because I'd gone from, you know, being a pro bodybuilder, traveling the world every week. You know, going to different all over the world, doing seminars, guest spots, whatever. You know, doing, having all this exposure with Pro Lab in in the flex and whatever, and doing articles to being nobody. When you lose your identity, the phone stops. 
Sure. So nobody wanted me. Nobody, everybody wanted to see me as the, the 300-odd-pound freak, you know, bouncing up and down the stage, throwing his arms up and frightening people, and guess what? But no, I, uh, I'd lost all that. And, and the thing was, it, it hurt me because it just felt like you'd been pushed to one side in, mm. in some ways. You know, so, yeah, I had a bit of counselling and it took me time to come to deal with that. I didn't want to go anywhere when I started losing weight, you know. Sure. I just felt that, that it's all gone. Right. It wasn't me. Right, right. So, right now, today, bring us up to the date. You're 10 years later post-transplant. Uh, do you feel like you've kind of adjusted and you you have a good balance now? It took me, you know, people always ask me uh, if I miss it. I said, yeah, I miss it a little bit, but not really because I kind of, found other interests and I'm still involved in bodybuilding but in a different capacity. Do you feel that you, you have a different a different way of looking at bodybuilding now that you're out of the sport? Do you know what? At one stage I turned my back and walked away from it mm -hmm. because in some ways I just felt I'd been let down by the sport, mm -hmm. you know? I just feel that we're like, at some point in my life I was a puppet and for federations or whatever, I was tailored around the world. I know I was on contracts and I got and I got paid for it and I got good sponsorship deals. But you you know, you were taken around the world and you know being a being a world class bodybuilder, there's nothing to support you afterwards. No sure. nothing sure. with the federations to put support people like me afterwards. It's like people coming out of the army with mm. PT, PTSD, there's nothing to support them. Right. Some of us right. just fall by the wayside. Some of us, unfortunately, have something to go back to. But, you know, I just, yeah, at some point in my life, I just turned my back on it because there was no help there. Right. I can remember right. in, uh, in Budapest when I first collapsed on stage, you know, nobody from the IFBB came to, to the hospital to see if I was all right. Mm -hmm. You know, the next thing they, at breakfast the next morning, well, oh, are you okay? Is everything all right? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've just been whisked through the streets of Budapest in the back of an uh, in the back of a, a ambulance with the blue lights flashing, and you're asking them if all right, you know. And as I say, there's nothing for bodybuilders afterwards to, to look after them, and I think it's just wrong sometimes. Do you, you think though today, today in, in today's uh, I guess you could say bodybuilding world, it, there's there's better options because it's it's almost like the bodybuilders are forced to fend for themselves because there's no magazine contracts, there's very few supplement contracts. So guys are tending to go online, using social media, coaching people. I, I feel that it's going to make bodybuilders better because when they're, they're done competing, they'll have businesses and an ability to earn a living for themselves without having to depend on the, that check coming in every week from the supplement companies oh. or from the magazines. Oh, yeah. You know what? You still find that so many people on the internet now making money through their, through their Facebook or, right. or, or whatever, through, through the website, social media. And I look back and I think, you know, if social media had been around in my day, I think that um, I kind of made a fortune. <laughs> yeah, we were, me too. I would have, I wanted to, if I could have filmed myself training back in the day, it would have been crazy probably, right? <laughs> you know what makes me laugh? Some of these people that train themselves training and, and I think they're the mass monsters and they're using every way. And, uh, people are paying to see it. That's I'm right. Thinking, oh Troy, how did you get the name The Dinosaur? Uh, Who gave it to you? I was, I was in the gym one day and uh, I said something silly to one some, to one of my friends. I was was training. I said something silly, uh, and I, uh, I I just my mate turned around and says to me, "You're like a dinosaur, you are, Sean." I said, "Why?" He says, "Well, it's great big body and a little brain." I was like, <laughs> <laughs> "That's great." And you know what? It stuck. So everybody started calling me the dinosaur. So <laughs> so. Then, friend of mine come along and he says, Sean, right, I've got this idea. We're going to make some T-shirts and uh, I want you, the logo, the dinosaur logo, barbell, uh, <laughs> I, I sell my own company, pro-am clothing. I'm going to sell it all over the country. Next thing, the guy's making a fortune. And all I'm getting out of it is just tracksuits every week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and he said to me, well, I said to him a few years ago, how much was you making in, in like 1989, 1990? He says, well, put it this way, Sean. Me and my mate were profiting twenty-two thousand pounds a week. We were Whoa. Oh my god! And I said, "What? Are you using my logo?" And it was all. He went, "Yeah, all right, I was." And I, I was getting tracksuits. He went, "Yeah, sorry." <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know. it's good to be the dinosaur. That's for sure. Sean, it was great. You know what? It was great talking to you. I think we got to get you back, maybe for one of the Iron Rages or 
do another show, talk a little bit about some of the supplementation and stuff like that because you know it was it was a bit different back in the '90s, and I, I think people are going to be more interested to hear about that. And I know you got a lot of bunch of stories about the Grand Prix tour and all the shows you went oh, on. So I uh, know what, Dave. I, I've got so many stories that to, to tell you, it's unbelievable, and you will laugh. All right, Honest. we're gonna, we're going to get you back for part two. Let let's let's end it here because I, I want to people to get a little taste of who you were because people forgot. And we're going to get you back for part two. Maybe I'll get Lee Priest on too. We'll do. We'll talk about all the shows and, and all the fun you guys used to have in Europe. Oh, well, me and him on tour. Yeah, I'm telling you, we were crazy. Because you guys both worked for ProLab together, right? We was in ProLab together. I actually yeah. got him his contract there. At ProLab. It was oh, so you funny did? when we were on tour. That's yeah. Funny. And we want. I tell you one story, not quickly, but one day we was uh, we we had to uh, to go and uh, meet all the big distributors for ProLab all over the world on a, on, a, on a dinner, on a breakfast. And we uh, we made out that we was in a gay relationship. <laughs> Listen, I'm leaving it at that and I'll tell you the full story next time where you won't believe what we were doing. All right, I'll sounds good. So guys, you're going to stay tuned for part two with, with Sean the Dinosaur Davis. For now, I'm Dave Palumbo. Uh, Reminding you guys, this weekend, upcoming NPC Nationals, don't miss it. Sean, thank you so much for, for joining us today. All right, just let me know when you want to do it, and I'll be available. All right, and that's going to take us to the end of okay. another episode of Live With, brought to you by Species Nutrition. Visit speciesnutrition.com. I'm Dave Palumbo. We'll see you next time. Cheers.